Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, I'm going to start with the Executive Director's Report, but before I do that, I want to introduce a few people. Um, Andy, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Sure, Andy Leo, Director of Hospital Finances, Hospital That's Systems system. Finance. That's good That's awesome. tough one. Yeah. Christina Laughlin, Executive Assistant. Connor Kennedy, Information Management Officer. And I did notice in the audience we have an esteemed member of the uh, Vermont House, Representative Alice Miller. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Alice. Did you, did you say esteemed? I did. <laughs> or just steamed. <laughs> My name is Kevin Mullen, and I'm uh, the chair of the board, and I'll have the members of the board introduce themselves. Hello. Uh, my name is Jessica Holmes. Uh, I've been on the board for coming on, I guess this is three years. And I also teach <coughs> now at Middlebury College. I'm Judy Henkin. I'm not on the board. Um, I'm general counsel to the board. And I'm Susan Barrett, and I am the executive director for the board. And not to put you on the spot, <laughs> Morgan, as you want. What an entrance. <laughs> Hi, I'm Maureen Eastmark, and uh, I guess I'm one of the most members of the board. Um, we have um, more of a finance background and budgeting. And I also want to introduce our statewide healthcare advocate who is shadowing us for a couple of days. Mike, you want to stand up? Mike Fisher? Hi, Mike Fisher. I'm the healthcare advocate uh, at Vermont Legal Aid. And if anybody ever has a situation where um, consumer needs some help, they're the ones to go to. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Susan for the Executive Director's Report. Yeah, and I don't know if you want to approve the minutes first. I was actually going to take my time to tell folks who we are and what we do. It's up to you. Okay. Um, do I have a motion on the minutes? I will move the minutes of October 5th. I'll second. Would you like to make it a joint motion and also approve the... Uh, as well. Yes, I would like to also move the meeting of October 18th. I would also like to that. Okay, is there any discussion? <laughs> Not hearing any. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Susan. Okay. So, first of all, thank you everyone for coming out this afternoon and um, listening to us, really, really listening to the Bennington uh, healthcare providers. Uh, but what I thought would be important was just to level set. Many folks in this room know who we are and what we do, the Green Mountain Care Board. But I literally have two slides that talk about our duties and our role. And then I'm going to pass it over to Board Member Lund. She's going to give a primer, very brief primer on the all care model uh, because that is essentially what we're doing right now, a big chunk of it. So, um, and then we'll pass it back over to uh, the Bennington Healthcare Providers. So, who is the Green Mountain Care Board? The board was created by the Vermont Legislature in 2011 by passage of Act 48. It's an independent group of five Vermonters, and if you're doing your math, you might count one, two, three, four. We currently have a vacant position. Uh, board member Con Hogan retired at the end of September, and we are eagerly awaiting the appointment from the governor and um, the members of the board are nominated um, by a broad-based nominating committee. Then those, um, those names are sent for, the, the, that group of names are sent forward to the governor, and then the governor selects a person for the board. Once um, they are uh, selected, uh, the full Senate confirms that appointment. So fingers crossed we'll get a new board member very soon. Um, the, a couple of key points about the way we do our work, uh, it's transparent. Everything that the board does is guided by Vermont's open meeting law. So whenever there's a form of the board, it's in full public view. And then the last part I'd like to say on this slide is that 
Uh, it's key to see that the board is independent. So the board isn't part of the legislature. It's not part of the administration. It's truly an independent board. And that, uh, that is a real benefit when it comes to making these major decisions around healthcare. So uh, it's kind of small print, but briefly, what do we do? The board is charged with what, we, you know, in, in health policy terms is the, the, the triple aim. We want to reduce the cost of healthcare while at the same time maintaining access to high quality healthcare for all Vermonters. We do that in a few different ways, and I'm, I'll just briefly run through this list. And I like to bucket them out into different areas, regulation, innovation, and evaluation. Our regulation circle has actually grown extensively over the years. Um, we're, we, we started out um, regulating health insurers and any kind of uh, request to change rates in the health insurance market, which includes the exchange rates. We, Tom D knows this very well, have a very robust hospital budget reviews uh, uh, process where we ask the hospitals to um, hold to a net patient revenue target year over year. We also look at any kind of major medical uh, capital expense in the state that triggers our CON Certificate of Need statute. And we um, review that and approve or disapprove of those applications. We also um, are regulating the impl implementation of the LPR model, and Robin's going to go into this more deeply, but last year the legislature gave the board oversight of accountable care organizations, ACOs, and that means in, uh, that the board must now approve any ACO budget in the state and also um, review, uh, certify any ACO that wants to uh, participate in payer programs in the state. And, you know, I, right now our innovation role is really moving into our regulation role. And we were just talking, we're probably going to collapse this and make it one, maybe two big bubbles. But we're also, you know, innovating around payment reform and, and healthcare reform. We also have the um, responsibility for our all payer claims database, which is de identified claims uh, from uh, medical um, insurers. And we use that data to try to really look at ways to reduce the cost of care while maintaining access and quality. And then we're, um, we're regulating, as I said, the ACO all payer model agreement. And then lastly, but not leastly, we evaluate. So we evaluate any type of uh, pilot uh, reform activity in the state. We also are just about to finish up the evaluation of the State Innovation Model Grant. Some of you may have heard of this. It was called the SIM Grant. It's a $45 million grant that the federal government gave to Vermont. Um, and it really was a precursor and really kind of um, training wheels for what we're doing now in terms of the all-payer model agreement with the feds. It was, it was a way to bring providers together, like we're seeing to get today, to test new ways of um, paying for care. And then lastly, we look at the uh, Vermont Health Connect plans that are offered on the exchange, and we evaluate those and making sure that there's affordability and access to care through those plans. And I think that's it. So I'm going to turn it over to Robin to talk a little more deeply about the open model. Great. Thank you, Susan. As Susan said, our work is guided by the triple aim of improving health, improving quality of care, and controlling health care costs. And the all pair model is really the next step in uh, working on those three high-level goals. Uh, Basically, there's, I'm going to try and avoid jargon, but this is healthcare, so good luck to me. Um, basically, the, what the all care model is trying to do is get the state all rolling in the same direction around cost containment and quality improvement, and really trying to shift from a focus on, on uh, sick care, you'll hear people talk about sick care, to uh, improving health and focusing on wellness. Uh, so what, how does the model do that? It really does that by setting up high-level statewide goals, including a 3.5% growth target across Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial insurance. Um, that 3.5% is the 15-year economic growth in the state. 
So what it's trying to do is take healthcare costs that grow like this and economic growth that grows like that and, and put those more in alignment so that uh, as healthcare costs continue to change over time that Vermonters will uh, be able to see that growth slow and be more in line with wage growth and other sorts of economic indicators. That's the goal. Uh, we also have agreed with the federal government to uh, bring Medicare uh, financial growth more in line with national trends. So they part of the agreement is to come in just under national trends. And right now, Vermont's a little bit growing a little bit faster uh, in that area. It also creates and looks at uh, payment programs for accountable care organizations. Now, accountable care organizations are groups of providers that have come together to organize themselves uh, in a fashion to, again, improve health, improve quality, and reduce costs. Uh, so part of what our role will be regulating these new entities and making sure that as we move forward with the new model that, that we are really ensuring that what the accountable care organization is doing uh, makes sense for what our goals are as a state. And lastly, and again, certainly not least, uh, a big part of the all care model is these three high level population health goals and those are improving access to primary care. We know that getting access to primary care in Vermont is tough and that's why we picked this as a goal for the state to work on. Reducing deaths due to suicide and drug overdose and reducing prevalence and morbidity, morbidity of chronic disease. All three of those came out of uh, work that the health department does around Healthy Vermonters 2020 and identifying the areas around health and healthcare that Vermont needs to work on as a state. So at the high level, that's really what the all care model is trying to do is set out these targets for us all to be working together towards. Um, as Susan also mentioned, the legislature charged us with doing a new, regula new regulation for these new accountable care organizations. And, and this slide maps out the, the criteria uh, that Act 113 of 2016 charges us with. And we have two new regulatory functions that we are implementing this year. The first is looking at accountable care organization budgets and programs. Uh, so not just the financial piece, but also the care model and, and uh, how resources are being allocated. And then the second piece is also doing certification of these organizations. So we are literally right in the midst of doing these two new functions uh, this fall. And so I've already finished that slide. So with that, I think we wanted to just sum up, and Susan, I don't know if you want to jump in or you want me to just take this um, one. Yeah, I, I can take it. Just, you know, touting our own horn, which is probably a dangerous thing to do, but I think um, it's important to um, point out some of our results in uh, hospital budgets this year. Uh, there was a 3.6% re request for an increase, or roughly $86.9 million increase, and the board approved a 3.08% NPR increase. That's a net patient revenue. That's the target we use. Um, or 3.01% after adjusting for physician transfers. So that's a significant dollar decrease in the system. And then in terms of the exchange rate review, I mentioned uh, the board does have the um, duty to uh, uh, modify, approve, or disapprove those rates. And this year, the board, Blue Cross Blue Shield came in with an 8.2% increase, and then they amended it to 8.6, and the board approved a 7.3 increase. And for MVP, the board approved a 3.7% increase. So I think that it's, again, important to tout our own horn, and um, if you have any questions for the board, our website is um, filled with lots of data and materials and also reach out to us if um, you have any questions. So I think we should turn it over to... Um, Susan, before the, you do that, I, I should just say, I think we do have a typo on the slide because the Blue Cross rate increase was... You know, I think, I actually think that we, as I was reading that, I think we have to update the slide. I think this it may be last year. Last year's so let me just say, we did really well last year. <laughs> I'm reading that and I'm like, I think well, last year they amended it, so we'll update this slide. I don't have the numbers, so it was uh, it's it's about 10, 10, 10, 10, 7, I believe, down to 8, 9. 8. I, I believe. For Blue Cross. Yeah, for for 8, 7. It was, 
eight, seven. Yeah. But the numbers are wrong. Yeah. So, and but they're they're and correct for the year smaller. before. Sorry about that. That is not. Yeah. That is not updated. So now we can turn it over to Bennington, and we want to hear from you and the great work you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. And thank the, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the board for making this trip down here. I know at our last uh, meeting, the budget meeting, Kevin said, I think we should make a trip down here. I think the board members all agreed. And I was very pleasantly surprised that you could follow up that quickly. To be down here. I know <laughs> tomorrow, you're, I think you're over in Brattleboro. Yes. So you're doing the southern, your southern run. So thank yeah, you very much. <laughs> and I see you, you, you all brought your son with you. It certainly wasn't sunny this morning, and uh, after last night, we survived a, a crazy night. But uh, it's great to have you here. And I also thank Bennington College. Bennington College, right now. They, uh, they've been terrific in terms of helping to host these events for us, and uh, they've been a real partner. So, um, you know, thank you very much for all you do. So, um, so, um, I'm just going to kind of tee this up, and we have uh, a series of our partners here who are going to present. Uh, this this will be quick quick vignettes. This is not going to be a long presentation. I think our overall presentation is between 40 and 45 minutes. But um, the idea is really to talk about um, the, I think the major initiatives that we're moving towards as we try to migrate to this to this community collaborative model. And um, so maybe I can just take a moment to talk to you about, you know, what we're faced with, and you've heard some of this before, so I, I won't belabor it, but uh, I know in the past I've kind of called it a region in crisis. And, um, you know, we're in a crisis uh, challenge, but I think there's, um, I think there's a pathway towards um, bettering things and having, you know, finding, uh, uh, I guess, a, a partnership of working together that I think will strengthen the region and strengthen all of us together. So that's kind of one of one of our themes today. So um, let's see. This is here. Okay. So you've all heard about this. This is not new to, to the group, um, certainly the, the board um, and, and the audience members. We talk about this a lot. But the the, the social determinants of health. I mean, what's pretty clear from the research is that. Um, the factors that drive a healthy population really is not the healthcare system per se. It plays a role. It plays an important role. But the role is probably maybe you know, somewhere in the area of 20% of overall health and well-being relates to, the, to our healthcare system. And the, relate, the other items are areas such as you know, how well people do from an economic standpoint, their income, uh, what their education status is, what type of housing they live in. And, um, and all the support services that surround um, a, a community. So um, really those social determinants of health is an area that we're focusing on more and more as we go forward. And that's what you're going to hear from our, from our, um, our panel members today in terms of their, the work that we're doing there. Our demographics, we've certainly talked about this at the Green Mountain Care Board. And, and Vermont, in general, is a challenged state with the age of the population. I think we're the second oldest um, state in the country. And I'm not sure if we're creeping up on Maine or not, but I think we are as moving towards the oldest. But we're one of the oldest counties in the state. I think we're the, we're the, um, the fourth out of 14 counties. Our 65 plus population is growing, as you can see here. Um, and we're shrinking on those below 64. And certainly the 15 to 30 is a, has been an exodus that we're dealing with, and that has us certainly very concerned. So, in, in overall, our population is is slightly shrinking, and that's again a concern that um, has us all nervous, especially as we work at look at workforce development issues. This is a, a big issue for us as we go forward. And then he talked about the. You know, the P word, which is poverty, and it's very significant in our, in our region. You know, one out of three children here live in poverty. Um, you know, what's remarkable is 81% of our kids 
as, uh, or kind of qualify in, um, and um, qualify for the free and reduced long uh, lunch system in our schools. You know, we're 75% of the state average. Um, and when you look at our overall household incomes, we rank 188 out of 282. So clearly we have a challenged economic standpoint from, the, from what people are making. And, and we know how important the income level is to deal with this, these social determinants of health. Our labor force is, um, when we look at the, the, the you know, well, gross numbers, you know, 4.4% unemployment doesn't sound terrible, but uh, it's certainly below the state average of three. And as you can see by this chart here, we're going in the wrong direction. We're going down, you know, we, we had a, a peak around 2006, and we've been heading, heading downward ever since then. And that's really a, a challenge. I'll show you another chart which highlights even more. Um, I always talk about the tale of two cities in terms of Vermont. And, you know, you have Burlington, which is up in the blue line, and Burlington shows the, the job growth they've had there. And it's, it's been um, pretty robust overall when you look at it, especially over in, um, based at 2007, which was near the one uh, uh, part of the session period. But look at the, look at the red, and that's Bennington. And um, you know, we've been below that, the black line for quite some time. So we have less people now than we did back, back in 2001. And when you, when you add that all up, it's almost 2,000 fewer jobs. And uh, for this size region, that's a very significant number. I mean, the, the need to find high quality, decent paying jobs is, is vital. And um, you know, we're, we're not winning that battle right now. That's something that a lot of us are focusing on, and you'll see more about that. But um, clearly it's one which concerns us. Our education system, it's another area of, let's call it opportunity for us. Two out of three children attend a school, um, elementary school here, that's not performing where it needs to perform at. Um, you know, if you look at some of the numbers here, and I won't dwell on them, but um, our two schools, uh, two of our schools ranked um, 174, 175 out of 177 in the state in terms of performance. That's not going to do it for us. We realize that. And, and we're partnering with our education partners to work on that. Um, one of them is doing pretty well. Um, overall, the Vermont numbers are you know, not as high as they should be. But we've got to do a much better job, especially for the younger kids, to turn this tide. And that's something that we're going we're to focus as a community towards doing that. And then you get to the area of, of health. And um, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. 28% you know, of our, our adults are obese. When you add overweight to it, the number is much higher. But obese is 28% in our area. Um, and we have a high rate of smokers, 25%. And 35% of moms smoke during pregnancy. I will say, from what's done on this chart here, from the hospital standpoint, um, our rate of addiction for moms who have um, babies is getting very high. Where in the past it was you know, under 5%, now it's in the upper teens, a big number. Um, dental decay, major problem. I mean, we all know how dental services track closely with medical, medical health. And so poor dental health leads to uh, poor medical health. And then we have three communities that have major drinking water contamination, PFOAs. That's something that really wasn't on our radar screen a few years ago. Now it's a very significant item on our radar screen. Opioid uh, uh, epidemic, I mean, you've heard us all across the state. We're no different. A 300% increase in drinking volumes and growing in high teenage pregnancy rate. So the healthcare indicators are, are a very significant challenge. And this kind of goes back to you know, the area in terms of insurance coverage. So you know, if you look at the, the box in the far left, you can see that um, our area, this is, this is kind of, Jim, this is kind of the SBMC market area? Yes, it is. Okay. 
So you can see there is that we're, we're less than um, the state average in the national average in terms of people who have commercial insurance. But yet we're a lot higher on the Medicare and Medicaid side. So again, it, it shows a picture of a payer mix that creates a lot of challenges, whether you're in healthcare, whether you're socioeconomic side, whether you're in education. This is a this is a challenging market in terms of dealing with some of the problems. Tom, can you just I'm just interrupt you. Yes. Okay. Can you just remind us of what this breakdown looks like when you just look at Vermonters, the parents of Vermonters, not the out of state? So this is, well, there's the Vermont average is in here, Jim, so. Vermont average, that's um, the orange bar is 10 zip codes, eight of the 10 are Vermont, two are New York. Okay. And the New York zip codes don't dramatically differ from the Vermont zip codes in terms of their proportions across them. So. Thank you. Yeah. So, so when you and I were on the panel together, you mentioned the percentage of the total revenue. Of the total, so the total revenue, so these, 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 are, these are people. The total revenue, for instance, SDMC, is about 77% is um, Medicare and Medicaid here. One of the highest in the state, I don't know, I mean, you, you all may know better than I do, I think it's one of the highest in the state in terms of our uh, percent of the Medicare and Medicaid. We're, we're a disproportionate share hospital, that means our, a very high percent of our business is, uh, is Medicare and Medicaid. And uh, that number is growing. It's not shrinking, and um, and as we as we see more and more business coming into our region from out of state, you also see a, a lot of uh, Medicare and Medicaid patients from out of state coming. In. So, um, yeah, what are, we, what are we starting to do about this? And this is where you're going to hear about the team, the people here who are working together, which has been, a, I mean, I think a great experience. And we have a lot of professionals here who. Um, who are really stepping up to look at these challenges that we're faced with. Um, one of the major things we're doing from a, uh, uh, an economic development standpoint is trying to work toward revitalizing our region. This is a rendering of the downtown of Bennington. It doesn't look like that right now, but we're hoping over the next few years it will look like that, where um, this redevelopment project of major employers, the school here, Bennington College, Southern Vermont College, the hospital, the bank, <coughs> Global Z, some other smaller businesses, all partnering together, all making major investments, because uh, we realize no one's coming to bail us out. It'd be nice, but that's not going to happen. And what we're saying is we have to come in and we have to create an engine for economic initiatives in our region here. And that engine can hopefully help to spur some of these other major initiatives that hopefully will work together. So we're working on the, the redevelopment project. We have a Southern Vermont Economic Development Zone, which is being created, partnering with Wyndham County, which will be there tomorrow. Uh, I think that's the synergy is, tr is a real opportunity. Uh, we're working on, on workforce development issues. All of us are doing this work, because the workforce will be the, our future. And we're starting in the schools. We're starting to get the kids at a younger age. Um, and we're trying to create a new environment that spurs uh, entrepreneurs to want to come here. And just in the last uh, couple of years, we created a little bit of a, um, an entrepreneurial kind of workshop in terms of helping um, have people come, young businesses that come and work together in, a, in an environment that spurs their, their initiatives. Um, all, all based on partnering. Not one organization, not one person, not one firm can do this. We need to partner together. And I think we can make some uh, enhancements, but it's going to be a challenge. And um, we'll talk more at the end about this in terms of the next steps. So I want to uh, ask Jennifer Fells to come up and, and talk next. You know, Jennifer is, our, is uh, the director of our Blueprint, and she's also the co chair of the of the, um, the Bennington Community Collaborative, which started um, a couple years ago. Yes. yes. And um, again, Jennifer is, a, is a, a great individual in terms of helping to bring people together and to have a dialogue and also get the impetus towards making change. So I'll have Jennifer talk next about what she's doing, and then we're going to have our presenters talk. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
welcome. Um, I also I have to welcome my community partners that are here. Uh, it's unfair for me to talk. They're doing such a great job. They're great colleagues. And I hope I'll point them out and I won't miss somebody, so I don't affect anybody. Uh, Bennington, uh, we have a community collaborative. That's exactly what it is. It's our community partners coming together. Um, everybody has an equal vote. Uh, we have uh, support from SDMC and the Blueprint. We did a network analysis. They're seen as the integrators. So it doesn't mean you're the boss or you decide what happens. Everybody has an equal vote. Everybody comes to the table and we're coming into alignment on how are we going to address the issues that Tom brought up about health. I mean, there was the, according to the research, you can see the clinical care only really has a 20% impact. You need excellent clinical care, you need good doctors, you need a great hospital, you know, to do that. It's so precise. Uh, you want to do that well. But there's the other determinants of health that as the partners in our collaborative, that we know we can leverage each other's work and that we can be in alignment and we can address some of these issues from the perspective of health. And health is that very broad definition that came about from the World Health Organization actually a very long time ago in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. it's, it's looking not just free of disease and infirmity, but really that you're able to have a productive life. You know, you're, you're a part of your community, you have a healthy family. So it's that broad definition of health. Uh, the partners at the table, our leadership group, uh, are listed here. I won't mention all of them, but it's a broad uh, from uh, Agency on Human Services, Department of Health, as well as clinical uh, services that are in our community, such as home health, uh, long-term care, we have the Bennington Free Clinic, uh, SASH is at the table. So it's really a great partners. I, I, this, um, when I'm thinking about the policies and programs, that last green bar that's a part of the model, um, that's really where the blueprint comes in and the state of Vermont uh, doing programs like SASH, even the all care model, the support we're getting from One Care Vermont, that makes this work possible uh, with those resources and working with, uh, I work with staff, we all just all the time about SASH. You know, that's a non medical, non clinical, but it's making a difference on patients not falling. Uh, people having less emergency department visits. So it's that non-medical piece is really making a difference and we see it in the data. And the same with the blueprint data. We say that having the services that address the social determinants of health does improve the quality and it does reduce the cost. So so that is possible, you know, and it is able to happen. Uh, the model here is from the state model that was part of the um, Accountable Communities for Health Learning Collab that was sponsored by the SIN money, so you're probably all aware of that. But all the communities sent representatives from across the state and they did participate in learning. How do we get people together to do this work? How do we align our our goals? So, you know, and how do we leverage each other's work? So uh, going on to the next slide. Um, alignment. Uh, I think it's become my favorite word. When I look at the all care goals, Robin, you outline what those are. And then the team came together and we have current strategies. The ones that are listed up in the three boxes, current strategies, those are only examples. We probably have a list of solid 25 to 30 strategies that run the gap, the Women's Health Initiative. Uh, we're doing universal risk screening of women uh, who are at risk uh, in the OB practice with a social worker and referring them to the community agencies. Since this started actively in May with staffing, we've addressed over 80 women that were at high risk and the OB pro uh, provider, Dr. Small, said, and I always use the quote, this has been a game changer. You know, we got great clinicians, but they say, I can't ask the question if I don't have a resource, you know, in my 15 minute visit. So these are women that are very high risk and they're able to, to go into services. Just one example of the many things. So we're aligning our strategies with the all payer model goals. You can see that there's a direct correlation to those, to those goals. And um, the future strategies, things that are in the works, 
that we're addressing. Uh, a downtown express care, a town alluded to having services in the downtown area, a dental clinic that's desperately needed in Bennington, um, and virtual primary care, making primary care more accessible, easier, on demand, when I want it, what I want, and I'm, I'm able to have that service. Uh, methadone health services, we have five spoke services in Bennington which provide buprenorphine, soon to be six. Um, we have one practice that is onboarding, but we do not have methadone. So that is something that Tom, uh, United Counseling Services, our designated agency, are actively working on if we can have those services. Patients have to drive every day, an hour and back, from either Rutland or Bradmore. So, you know, that's that's really a barrier to people having treatment that's evidence-based and we know it saves lives. So. And, uh, and also telemedicine in the future. Making, uh, we're a small rural community, we can recruit those super specialties or uh, improve access and really give us those services that we might not otherwise have. If anyone's interested in that topic, our board meeting tomorrow in Yadabro is focusing on telemedicine. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's great work that, that's being done. Um, right now it's in the acute care setting, but there's certainly a lot of potential for that. Well, it's in the emergency department, the ICU, neurology, other specialties that people would not have access to or they have to drive to Burlington or Dartmouth or, you know, that's, that's a hardship and it's a barrier to good care. Um, I was asked to what were the barriers and challenges? Uh, there was a survey done by the Blueprint um, that surveyed all the communities looking at what were the challenges and they were very common across the communities. Uh, funding the, this type of work and we have good examples like SASH is funded in the Blueprint so that has made a difference. Um, and for our partners that do this work, you know, to you know, support a little bit to help them come to the table. So. Uh, and that is something that is being rolled out uh, by the risk communities um, with One Care Vermont is supporting the designated agency, Home Health, the Council on Aging, you know, to support their participation in this and extra work that it takes to do that. Uh, other challenges, uh, when I was kind of canvassing people for this, are silos of organizations, you know, everybody has their own funding stream, their criteria. So it's really how do we align that so that we can leverage that work. And certainly that transition um, from fee-for-service to population health, that, that's, that's messy, hard, slot of work. That's, that, that's going to take some really, uh, a lot of creativity, a lot of thought, you know, on how we do this smart so that we can achieve these goals. So um, I think we have a great team in Bennington. Um, um, it, it's a very rewarding work to do this, so um, it's a very passionate um, team of people. Um, do you have any questions? I'll just pause if you have anything specific before I introduce our speakers. You yeah, okay. I would just jump in and that's okay to, to mention related to your challenges. I'm really glad you brought up capture of shared savings and the transition from fee for yeah. service to population health because I think one area that is really hard to think about is if what you're doing is avoiding unnecessary spending, that right. doesn't create a pocket of money. That just means you've spent less money. Right. right. And so that's that's an area that I think we all have to be creative and thinking about. Yeah. Um, and part of why I think there's tentative promise in the, uh, the risk-based ACO model because it's a, a way that you can provide money prepaid so that if you do have savings, you are capturing actual dollars, which that right. can be invested into population. Correct. In their research, if you look at other European models, what they've done, that's what they've done. They've invested in those population health strategies. Mm -hmm. And really, it's reduced the, the other spending that, that occurs. So it's a reinvestment of the dollars. It's not new money. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a reinvestment. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have three people that of uh, my partners that I work closely with. Um, there's certainly many stories that could be told, um, but just very short vignettes. They're going to give an example of a real person that had been de-identified, and to um, 
just say a little bit how we work together as partners. What does that look like? You know, this is very theoretical. I brought up the top of them. So, what does a real patient look like? Our first is uh, Dr. Reed. Uh, she's the medical director and interim director for community uh, rehab team and United Counseling Services. So, good afternoon, and it's a real pleasure to tell you a little bit about the joy we've had at working at Southern, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center in partnership. And this particular case sort of illustrated not only how we work with the team inpatient, because that's where the client was, but that it involved many other community points of service. A 25-year-old mother, she had a set of twins, and this was therefore her third child, and right as she delivered in a very non-medical term, she went totally bonkers. Mm -hmm. She went very manic and hadn't slept and was making no sense at all, and in fact was exhibiting behaviors that were quite dangerous to the baby. So there she is on maternity and child, an open unit with very well-meaning nurses who are very attentive. However, um, it was a night or a day, weekend, in which there were many babies being delivered, so it was exceedingly busy as well. And there was a lot of concern. In fact, our psychiatric consultant spent many extra hours with her. She had been receiving care at our IMAT program, Medical Assisted Treatment, um, with Suboxone, and that had been keeping her stable prior to admission for delivery. Um, she had not been taking other medications on purpose in order to make the baby as healthy as possible. And it was basically a healthy delivery. But she was disoriented. She was not a capable of rational thought. And they had to call DCF, who came in and understood that. And she was able to relinquish the baby the next day temporarily to DCF custody and then work towards, over the succeeding weeks, getting her back. In the course of all of that, we found out that she had connections with Sunrise, she had a home worker, she had caseworkers. Those people and those eight pieces of information came part of the history and connected a web of information that was not immediately known and was not immediately shared at IMAT either. Those clinicians provided the recommendation for how to pick up and resume her online treatment to prevent her from becoming addicted and maintain her sobriety. We initiated medications that luckily worked over the course of the weekend very quickly um, between Friday to Monday um, to stabilize her mood. And she was able to discharge successfully later in the week to home and to outpatient follow-up and did not need to go to inpatient treatment, which everyone was very concerned she would need to do and were prepared to do. They wrote up the paperwork but didn't sign it in case it needed to be executed quickly. We had to even talk with our emergency room because if she were not willing to stay, she had a very tenuous hold on being able to talk to the nursing staff. If she were not willing to stay, we would have to bring her down to the emergency room because that's the only place that's locked, that she wouldn't have wandered off. Because of her impairment and judgment, you had to have a contained unit so that she would be safe. The good news is, after she started sleeping, she started eating, and she started making more and more sense. So it was a good news all around. She has been reunited with her baby, and is going forward. Mm -hmm. That's Thank a nutshell. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Stephanie Lane. She is the executive director of Shire's Housing. And that's also a part of um, that's the uh, home base for SASH support and services at home. Bennington has four and a half panels uh, of SASH participants, and, and we'd love to have some more. So that's 450 people in this community are being supported by SASH. Uh, it's really quite amazing. Stephanie. Thank you. Hi. So I'm Stephanie Lee, and I'm the executive director of Shires Housing. And yes, we're a housing group. Um, oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, we are also a member of the Accountable Community for Health team, and we're invited by Jennifer uh, to be a part of that, and that's been really a life-changing experience for me and um, very transformational for the organization as well. Um, we work with the SASH program, and Shires Housing supports the SASH program in Bennington and Deerfield Valley. We have four and a half panels, or 450 participants for SASH, and just in case you're not familiar with the SASH program, it coordinates resources of social service agencies, community health provide providers, and nonprofit housing organizations to support Vermonters who choose to live independently at home for as long as they choose to be at home. So for me, um, I am not a SASH coordinator, I am the director, but I've asked my coordinators to provide me with at least one example, and I don't know how they pinned it down to just one, because I know there are so many stories. Um, we just had a recent one, in fact. But they have chosen um, Betsy, so I'd like to tell you about Betsy. Um, she is a SASH, SASH participant here in Bennington, and was extremely anxious over some financial strain that she was having. Uh, she was spending hundreds of dollars per month, apparently, on QVC. Uh, I have a Nana that does this, so I can really... <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the pull of QVC. So uh, because of the amount of credit card debt on uh, several accounts that she had racked up because of this, uh, she wasn't able to pay for her basic health needs, so prescriptions, uh, her choices for care, patient share, potentially housing down the line if this was not addressed and some of those social determinants of health that we discussed, this is where SASH is really valuable in intervening and connecting the participant with resources that they may need. Um, sometimes it is medical and sometimes it is non-medical and in this case it was for credit counseling services and for someone to come in and just sit and do a budget with her and to help her to understand what her choices were going to mean to her and what the ramifications might be for her. So we were able to connect her um, with Ethan, who is a case manager and a money management volunteer. She's reduced her debt with continued support from her team. Um, so the partners in this case were the SASH coordinator and really the Southwestern Vermont Council on Aging um, was very instrumental in, in turning this around for her. Um, in general, I mean, for her, the personal outcome was that you know, she is now on a, a better stable foundation financially and has some resources and some people to depend on. But in addition to her personal outcome, the outcome for staff participants uh, is a reduction in total average annual Medicare expenditure growth, saving $1,536 per beneficiary per year. And that's what we've discovered to this point. SASH has now been around for almost five years. So we've finally been able to collect enough data to show some real results for these for the uh, participants and for the community in savings. Um, an increase in advanced directives has been realized, a decrease in the rate of falls, and an increase in control of hypertension. Um, these folks have access to health care classes, to Tai Chi, to cooking classes, to community events. Um, they, we connect them with primary care physicians when necessary. We have someone in our portfolio recently who we noticed was faltering a bit. We weren't sure what was happening, and um, we had a SASH coordinator go in, and they hadn't been to a primary care physician in 15 years. Mm -hmm. And we found out that they had several um, advanced issues, health issues. So this is what SASH does. Um, so, you know, it's a, a taking a non-medical program uh, based in housing and collaborating with our local health care providers, our local wellness nurses, um, and other agencies to ensure better outcomes for the participants and allow them to stay home for as long as possible. Can I ask you a good question? Absolutely. Uh, that savings that the team that for the beneficiary, is that for this area or is that Vermont as a whole? That's statewide. There are almost 5,000 participants statewide now. Have you ever done an analysis for the impact in the local area? For the local area, we haven't brought it down to that level yet. Um, probably after year five, you'll see more local or panel-based results for that. We have four and a half, so we're breaking it down panel by panel expense and results. Some are community panels, some are housing host panels, mm -hmm. so that makes a difference as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last uh, case that we presented is by Billy Allen. 
Oh, she's an administrative director for ambulatory services and transitions of care at SBMC. Um, and she'll tell you her story. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for coming down here today. We're really thrilled to have you here to share our stories with you. Um, I am uh, the leader of our transitional care program, which we started about three and a half or four years ago, looking to find a way to bridge that gap between the hospital and primary care, figure out um, traveling with our patients, seeing the pathway that they travel, and trying to figure out where are the opportunities, where are the gaps. And we were supported by a grant, a SIM grant, that really helped us expand our transitional care program as well as fill in some of those gaps. Three programs were supported as a pilot program to really be able to uh, address those that now are being absorbed by the hospital and our budget. So lots of really good things happening. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Harvey, who is a 55-year-old patient who had really severe pulmonary disease. We call it chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And he had been in the hospital six times over the course of three months. And a couple of those hospitalizations required that he be in the intensive care unit on a ventilator. So high cost, high um, uh, recidivism for that particular disease. And Harvey was one of those tough Vermonters that when it was time for him to be discharged, he didn't want any services. You know, we tried to get him home care, no thank you. We tried everything we could think of to connect him with help because it was obvious that he needed help. And he kept saying, no thank you, no thank you. And that's really where the transitional care nurses became helpful. Because they show up and say, hi, I work with your doctor, Dr. Smith. He knows that you're in the hospital and he sent me to come and see you because he wants to make sure that you're doing okay. That transitional care nurse then sees that patient every day that they're in the hospital, doesn't interfere with the care deliver, delivered, but shares crucial information from the primary care records with the hospitalist, with the ED doc, with the pulmonologist, so that that information is flowing from one critical place to the next. Over the course of one of those hospital stays, Finally, he relented and said, you can come once, once to my house, just once. And when the transitional care nurse got in his home, what she found was not at all what we expected. And this is representative of what usually happens. He said that he lived with his son. He did not live with his son. His son lived eight hours away. <laughs> he said that he um, didn't need any help with food or medication or anything like that. His refrigerator was bare. And he was having great difficulty getting food to make sure that he stayed healthy. A critical thing that we found with him is that he was supposed to be on oxygen routinely. His oxygen was up in the bedroom. And that was up the stairs, and it was too hard for him to get upstairs, so he was only using it in the nighttime. Another reason why he kept coming in. And then we um, went over his breathing machine, which he received like a nebulizer that he needed as well, and he was doing that incorrectly as well. And so all of those were reasons why he kept coming back that we weren't able to fix by the hospitalization that we were able to do. So at that point in time, we hooked him up with our transitional care social worker. We found that when we tell patients in the hospital, when you go home, you need to do this, this, and this. They don't do any of them. They come back next month, and they have those same things to do. So we now try to work as an integrated team in our community so that the social workers kind of work together and see if we can do handoff from one to the next. She was able to help him with food, with transportation, and with getting some resources for his medications. Medications were a mess. He had a, a big bucket of them, and they were all confused and all mixed up. Some were not even in the right containers, and it took our clinical pharmacist team to come in and really unravel the just mess that was there for him. 
He also was on many, many medications, and he, number one, wasn't able to afford them and wasn't willing to take them all. So we needed to have a conversation with the physician, what are the most critical medications? And how do we put a plan together that helps us meet his needs and meet him where he's willing to be? Because there was a huge disconnect from what he would do and what the doctor really wanted him to do. Fast forward to three months later, lots of good things happening. The transitional care nurse visited him regularly. He let her. They built a relationship, so that relationship was strong. We um, found the discharge instructions that we gave him in the trash can, which is also not unusual. So I did bring a copy. We make a magnet now that goes on people's refrigerator, specifically for some of our chronic diseases and it's red, yellow, green in big letters and tell, tells them what to do. You know, if you gain two pounds, if you're short of breath when you lay flat, you know, this is what you do. They don't throw that away. They put it on the refrigerator and they use it. So that's been a wonderful addition. <clears throat> he um, has the social worker now that has put in place to make sure that he, that he has food, that he has coverage for the medications that he's now going to be on. And she checks in with him periodically to make sure that we're bridging the gap. And the most exciting piece is pulmonary rehab. Um, one of the things we identified when we started this program is that we had a really high rate of COPD and chronic lung disease from our high smoking rate. And we had no pulmonary rehab program. So we did put that together. He attended that six-week pulmonary rehab program and was able to stay out of the hospital for three months, which was amazing. Um, he's had a few ED visits, but not the visits like he had previously. And I think most exciting is the quality of his life. He can walk to the mailbox. He can walk up and down the stairs. He's starting to connect the dots that following this plan we put together is really going to improve his life, improve his ability to have a life, and really make a difference. So, you know, I think in closing, um, our transitional care nursing program has reduced hospitalizations by 50%. We measured the time six months to a year before the services and after. And we have seen consistently a 50% reduction in hospitalizations. I think more importantly, we have kind of seen um, care delivery through the patient's eyes and are now changing care delivery in our hospital. Um, our new nurses that have just started our nurse internship program are now going to go with the transitional care nurses so they can begin to translate what the reality is versus what we thought it was. And I would say that all of our transitional care nurses are seasoned hospital nurses. And we spent our life kind of with blinders on in that silo. And we really are trying to open the eyes in our community and elsewhere. Any questions? On your slide, if you uh, mentioned the uh, wait list for SASH. How long is that? Again, there's four and a half panels, and I, I think that we're trying to get more at this point in time. We try not to turn anyone away, but we are capacity at the moment. And, you know, I would say, you know, I think the exciting part is that there's a whole world of community partners out there that we have come together, and now to get hospital staff to understand what is available and how we could use that better has been a critical piece. And I think that we now are one united team. I feel like that silo between the hospital and the community is gone. And we meet regularly, we work together regularly, and I think we recognize it really takes a village to really take care of our population. And that's how we're doing that from now on. How did you model this program? How did you model this program? What was it after? And you know, are other hospitals you know, doing this throughout the state? I can tell you that when we first started, we looked at the research and found work done by Mary Naylor at the University of Pennsylvania. 
and she used uh, nurse practitioners. We didn't have nurse practitioners available, but did have clinical nurse specialists, which are similar, master's prepared clinicians. And so we modeled it after Mary's work. And in fact, she came and spoke at a regional conference we had last year. As part of our SIM grant, we gave a regional conference at Mount Snow and invited the entire state. Mary Naylor was our key note speaker and we handed out to everybody who attended a toolbox on how to put together this transitional care nurse program. Um, right now, Rutland has replicated it with our support and help, and we do have um, requests right now from Middlebury, from Northeastern, and Brattleboro, and Brattleboro have all reached out in the last uh, couple of months, so we're ready, willing, and able to help them. Dartmouth has just asked to um, have us help them as well. And um, we did just win a, a special award. And so that's starting to bring lots of people asking lots of questions. And it's been very exciting. In fact, um, I will be speaking in Arizona at the American Hospital Association Rural Health Conference about the program. So we're just very excited. A number of other hospitals <coughs> have tried using, I used to work in New Mexico, and a lot of other hospitals have used case managers to do a similar thing. One of the things, now working as a consultant with these teams and seeing the communication, one of the critical differences in this model is that you have trained nurses, not people who are non-medical, who understand the medical implication of the social decisions that people make and can educate in their home setting. And that's a, a really big difference than somebody who's non-medical trying to bring the information and maybe getting or not getting the translation from the medical team. And, and that's uh, and a really, getting, for these fragile people, right. it makes a, a big difference. Right, a relationship with the physician so they can trust us and, you know, take the information that we give them and make decisions based on it was a critical piece. Now we're looking for how do we do this most cost effectively? It took those master's prepared clinicians to put this program together, but they don't need to continue to be doing all those visits. So we're going to be looking at healthcare workers and, you know, different levels of people doing various pieces of it. I do believe that the reason that we won the award, because I asked, how did we win this award, Little Tiny Vermont? And I think what they were struck with is that we started with a program with nurses seeing patients and then we looked at all the gaps and we implemented a program in the emergency department for patients with addiction and mental illness where our community gets together a team and makes an integrated care plan with an advocate in the emergency department program in all of the nursing homes in our community where we have empowered nursing assistants to speak up, say when the patient's care has changed, and then immediately start some sort of report off so that there's an analysis of what's going on so that patient gets treated before it's the middle of the night. And our clinical pharmacists are here in the back of the room and they're another piece of it. So I think it was that kind of global community coming together is why we really were able to do it. Thank you. I think that's a good question if I may. Um, this, first of all, congratulations on the award and on this very innovative program, and I hope it does expand to the rest of the state because it's clearly impactful. Um, my quick question is just, is that how are patients chosen to receive these services, and is there a wait list for patients leaving the hospital that would benefit from these services so you don't have enough workforce yeah. to deal with it? I think that in the beginning we had criteria. We had age cutoffs. We were going to do it specific diagnoses. That didn't work because we have some people in their 40s that are chronic disease and are ready in the hospital a lot. So we got away from that cutoff of age. So many of our patients have multiple chronic diseases, so that didn't work as well. So we certainly start with the ones that are using lots of resources. But I think we found pretty quickly that any elderly person that is in the hospital for three or four days gets deconditioned they're too sick to listen to their discharge instructions and understand them. They're confused about their medications. So we have found if we only do one visit with them, maybe two, 
and make sure they get on the right track. And then what we do is we send a note or an email or whatever the doctor would like right before that first visit post-hospitalization. We send them a quick little summary, went to their home, this is what I found, this is what you need to focus on. And they love that because, you know, it's hard to gather that information and be prepared for that visit. So I feel like we're bridging you know, gaps all over the place, trying to be a support for primary care, and, and that has been a critical piece. So there is not really a, a waiting list. We try to see everyone that we can. We regionalized it, so there's a lot of traveling. So we have one nurse in the northern part, one nurse in the western part, and one in kind of the southeastern part, and that's the way that we've done it. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, I think that's a good example of, you know, you don't have to be the biggest, biggest facility or the best or the most well-known or the most resources. I mean, when we were, got that award and, and submitted our application, competing against the Mass Generals, the Cleveland Clinics, the Mayo Clinic, and um, in Bennington. And it's an example of, and this would not happen without the people in this room to make that, to make that program work. And, um, Again, I think that's you know part of our challenge and opportunity here. I mean, we have we have a vision plan called Vision 2020, and it's predicated on, on building partnerships, transforming how we do our business, and building sustainability. And um, you know, my board asks me all the time, I say, you know, Tom, why are you guys getting involved with all these initiatives? Why are you involved with you know building, building or renovating buildings downtown, buying um, old houses and, and uh, redeveloping them and selling them to our employees, um, getting involved with um, the homeless shelter in town, being involved with the drug treatment center in tennis here, and isn't that mission creep? You know, our our business is to treat people, is a is a care for their medical needs and. and my answer is that we're re we have to redefine what the H in healthcare means. And, um, you know, we talked about all these determinants of health in terms of what really drives healthy populations. And, and we need to change how we're doing business. I'll start with the healthcare system. Um, one of the toughest things I'm facing is building trust. You know, it's, it's a challenge. You know, so, so we're the biggest player in town. You know, we, we employ 1,400 people, and we have a budget of our health system of about 200 million. And, um, you know, so when you sit down at the table to decide, you know, what's going to be done, um, there's an automatic, because I've, you know, I've been there before, it's an automatic distrust of the healthcare system trying to, you know, take over things. And that's, we will not be successful if we try to do that. We've got to come up with a model that allows us to Created a new enterprise that's not a hospital, not a medical system, but it's a population health enterprise. And, and we're not here yet, but what the work that Jen is doing and Billy and all the folks in the room here is creating that model by first building trust of working together and demonstrating some outcomes. But we need to come up with a way that's going to have, you know, how are we going to run this business? How's, how's the governance going to work? You know, how, are we, how are we going to fund it? You know, I mean, you know, Robin mentioned, you know, maybe the one care can be helped to be an avenue for this funding system, but it's, we gotta figure out how do we fund it so all the participants are sustainable. Because if they fail, there's gonna be a hole in the system. And, um, you know, we have to do the, the data analytics and, um, you know, communication, and we have to create a system for accountability. But I think working together, and maybe with the help of an organization like the Green Mountain Care Board, as we come back and talk about the future models, um, you can help us here. Um, we're making headway, but we're just scratching the surface. And, um, and I, I'm learning from the example of the downtown redevelopment project. That's how disparate partners come together with a common vision to get something done. I think we can do that here, too. And I think it's being done by the people who are here and the work they're doing. And we just shared three vignettes. These are, I mean, there's 
many, 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 hundreds and more. I mean, and um, the story that each of these agencies can talk about are, are pretty remarkable. But this is a long haul. This is this is really changing, transforming how we do how we do business here. But um, if we don't do we won't do it now, we're gonna be up against it because the, the numbers are starving in terms of what we're faced with. So I guess um, we should throw it out and get questions for the audience too in terms because again we have all our we have our, our agencies in the audience here and certainly like to welcome any more questions you may have. Thank you, Tom. That was a great presentation and uh, we're rooting for you. <laughs> so uh, other members that uh, are here from the public, would you like to uh, say anything or ask any questions? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Richard Dundas, and uh, you probably are aware that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation does a county health ranking. Just one, just to introduce Dick, because Dick is a local physician, also has been heading up our, our free clinic for a number of years here, and it's been, you know, an incredible community asset that he's helped develop with a lot of the practitioners. Okay. Um, are you aware of the Robert Wood Johnson County? Some of you are, anyway. Um, they, they do health care rankings for counties, and um, we all um, agree in town that our hospital is one of the best, and uh, yet in county rankings in Vermont, we, we place 12 out of 14 counties. So there seems to be somewhat of a disconnect there. When you consider that Bennington County has two distinct demographics, the wealthier people in the North Shire and the poorer people in the South Shire, I would imagine that the South Shire actually ranks lowest in the entire state for, for healthiness. Um, so how do, you, how do we reconcile these two things and can we from the Green Mountain Care Board, can we expect any regionalization um, efforts on your, your behalf? I, I know that you um, represent the entire state, but here you have a section of town that is, a section of the state that is in crisis, as Tom says, and I agree with him. So is there anything that the Green Mountain Care Board can do for Bennington County in particular? given the state that we're in. So I think that uh, the interchange and flow of information is the, the most helpful. As we move towards an all-payer model, we're going to be looking very closely at uh, per capita health expenditures for each of the different hospital service areas. And once we start looking at the health system in Vermont through that lens, we're going to be focusing on why is it more expensive and what are the demographics involved, what's being done to address the demographics and things like that. So um, my colleagues are free to jump in. I would just add that I think part of what we're trying to do in our regulatory processes are to both connect that back to the local and regional level. So understand how when we look at Bennington's budget, understand that in the context of your community, but then also understand how that fits together with our statewide, most of our processes are statewide oriented. But I think uh, you've raised a really important point that healthcare is local. And so as we proceed with uh, all pair model and also just our overall regulatory duties, which you know do look often at a bigger population, we have to, uh, continue to work on connecting all those dots so that we are seeing a clear picture. Uh, so, you know, it's like we don't appropriate money. We don't have a budget for counties or anything like that. What we do is we look at insurance premiums that are offered on a statewide basis. Uh, we do look at each hospital individually. And as Kevin said, in the all-pair model, we're trying to connect all those dots better so that we get a more robust community level view. I can just piggyback on that a little bit. As a state, we have, you know, there's 20 different quality metrics that we have agreed to try and move the needle on. 
with respect to chronic disease, with respect to suicides, mental health, access to primary care. So one of the things that we're going to be doing going forward is checking in with all the hospitals in their hospital service area. Where are you on those metrics and what are you doing to move the needle? And as we think through uh, the ACO budget process and how the ACO is allocating money throughout the state, we're going to be looking at, you know, where are the regions where we really need to move the needle more? And how should that money be allocated to achieve the overall population health goals that we have signed on to for the all payer model? So regionalization and how we're looking at outcomes across the state, we're going to be focusing much more closely on health outcomes at, at county levels and at hospital service area levels going forward because we've committed to that and it's important to do so. I don't want to monopolize the conversation, okay. but uh, I think that it's more important for you to look at our social status here, the social determinants of our health, than it is how many people got mammograms and how many didn't. Can, can I just add one thing, um, Dick? I don't disagree. But I think what the board did this year was demonstrating that they that there's a special problem in this region because they allowed us through the budget process to exceed the cap that all the other hospitals were being held to because of some of the I think the examples we talked about here in terms of the, the, the special problems of region and crisis that we're faced with allowed us to, to go beyond some of the caps that um, some of the other hospitals had had to meet. So I, I view that as, a, as kind of a, a very strong sign of good faith that they realize that the Southern Vermont region has some special problems that need some special type of um, focus and assistance. And, and we're going to be coming back to them. I mean, I think we're going to be coming back to them with our plans for the future. So part of it is how well, how good of a case we make for our needs in terms of going forward. And um, I think this group is going to have, we're going to work hard together to kind of show you know, what we're trying to do to try to deal with some of these, these real crisis problems. And actually, that, the slide that uh, Tom had on here, um, you could take the whole rest of the state outside of the uh, northwestern section of Chittenden County in the surrounding area, and that's what it looks like. And, and that's uh, uh, a really sad statement for our state that the rest of the state is still performing at pre-Great um, Recession levels. And until the economy gets turned around, um, it's going to throw the demographics off as well because you're not going to have the younger children and things like that that balance things out. And so um, it's a daunting task that we have as a whole state, and it's not just this region that's Unfortunately, that's in that boat. When we were in Springfield, for Vermont, for example, they talked about one out of every two babies born at Springfield Hospital, their their mother has a substance use disorder, and and that just uh, tears you apart when you hear those stories. And we all know that Springfield has been hurting economically since the collapse of the machine tool industry. And I think one of the challenges this area really has, I just met with the finance team at the hospital, and it was really depicted on the slide that showed how much is from Medicaid and Medicare, because you're much higher than the Vermont average, so 22% for Medicare versus the average of 15, and 28 for Medicaid versus 22. <clears throat> but the issue with that is the reimbursement that you get for, for those um, services. So that was one of the challenges they were really talking about, you know, at the hospital is that payer mix. And you know, that's something we have to look at when we're looking at the budgets as well. Yes. So as a sort of a follow-up, uh, my name is Mary Garish. I'm from here in Bennington. And as a sort of a follow-up, and I would like to say that clearly our hospital is trying to do all kinds of innovative things to help the problem here in the South Shire. But I wanted to just, in the context of the all-payer and ACO situation, which is of course separate and apart from the wonderful kinds of things that the <coughs> hospital is trying to do. I want to- 
Well, yeah, they, uh, they obviously have to be to a certain extent, but I don't think that the ACL all hair uh, model has anything to do with the wonderful health programs that we've just heard about here. And, and so I wanted to just remind the board that, um, and, and read for the audience, that when this board was set up, the principles in Act 48 were to be the board's guiding mission, if you will, relative to all forms of healthcare reform, and so therefore including ACOs and all payer waivers. And it, what it says is that the state of Vermont must ensure universal access to and coverage for high quality medically necessary health services for all Vermonters. Systemic barriers such as cost must not prevent people from accessing necessary health care. All Vermonters must receive affordable and appropriate health care at the appropriate time in the appropriate setting. And so in the context of that being one of your principal missions, and in the context of the all payer ACO thing, my question to you is, how does the all payer ACO situation in any way advance any of the elements in this principle? How does it ensure that more people in Vermont will be able to access health care than are already accessing it? Thank you. Yeah, we do. Um, so uh, the all pair model is not about coverage. So right. it doesn't ensure universal access right. uh, uh, or any sort of coverage. If somebody doesn't have insurance, the all pair model will not fix that. Right. Uh, the all pair model, however, uh, one of the challenges in moving towards universal coverage was as we talked about before, healthcare grows like this, and the state economy grows like this, which means your tax base grows like this. So there's a gap between healthcare costs and uh, the, the economic uh, vitality of our state. And the all payer model, if it's successful, which again, it's beginning, we don't know if it will be successful or not, but I think the hope, and I think we should put it in, in those terms at this point since it's new, uh, is that it could help bend that cost curve in a way that will ensure that as we move forward, we as a state can afford, continue to afford health care, whether it's in Medicaid or whether it's people paying private premiums or any other future coverage initiatives. So until we can actually get that cost growth figured out, it's, it's very challenging to cover everybody because we know in our state budget, and uh, I'm sure Alice is a, it, I think Alice had to take off, but as a former appropriations or current appropriations person, every year she's faced with Medicaid cost overruns, which is not special because Medic there's nothing special about Medicaid that has it growing any faster than any other kind of health care. In fact, it grows slower. Right. Uh, but we can't afford it because of uh, the way we've structured our system. So I think that's what we're hoping the all-pair model will help help with is in that mission statement or those principles with the affordability components of the existing system. So if... Um, but it doesn't help with coverage. Right. So if one were to propose, um, or if a number of groups were to propose a financing system that would be able to do that, would your board want to consider that? Statutorily, um, the request would have to come through the other side of state government for us to analyze that. Mm -hmm. We can't on our own do what you're asking. Right. So if, if someone in the legislature submitted that to you, then you would consider it, right? Well, it would have to make its way through the legislature, signed by the governor, and come to us. So you wouldn't want to have hearings on that or anything like that in order to just determine until after the governor signed it. Is that what you're saying? Our current duties, if you look in Act 48 under our duties, we have a, a defined set of duties as a board and the principles right. are meant to inform those duties. Right. So the principles in and of themselves are not 
what we're supposed to be doing day to day. We're supposed to understand those principles and as we're looking at hospital budgets, think about it in terms of those principles. As we're doing a premium rate case, think about it in terms of those principles. Uh, but, but we don't really have jurisdiction to, uh, in our duties, to move forward on those sorts of things except as specifically defined by the legislature. So we're not a, we're not a court, we're a body that's created by legislation and the legislature determines the breadth or narrowness of our duties. Okay, oh, thank you. I thought you were had to give them the authority to um, consider different financing methods, but I'm making the same on that. Okay, are there other questions or comments from the audience? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure how this is related to what Miriam said. <laughs> One of the slides, I think it was Jennifer's slide, was talking about a current strategy and the improvement Could access. Could you just introduce yourself to me? Oh, I'm partner? sorry. Lee Russ, just a resident. Uh, one of the slides had a current strategy to improve access to primary care as a goal. And one of the current strategies, I believe, was labeled universal care plan. Is universal that your slide? Care plan. Yes. What is that? Um, we're working with uh, One Care Vermont a platform where a team comes together and if it's a patient that has counsel on aging, uh, works with a transitional care nurse, has a primary care doctor, perhaps is working with United Counseling Services, we can talk to each other about an individual and we can have a unified plan, we understand each other's goals, and we can work with the primary care providers so those goals are met. Um, we are finding as a healthcare system, we are, it's not even a system, we're very fragmented. Uh, I might be working with an agency, I don't know that Stephanie has a sash, I don't know that uh, there might be counsel on aging involved so that we can talk to each other and that we can have a unified plan so that the individual is successful. And we can work with the primary care. So it's a universal shared care plan. It's a tool that the community agency services can use uh, to support a person be successful. And people sign their consent yes. to allow that to happen. So Lee, I think your, your question also touches on a much bigger question, and, and that's the future success of the healthcare system is really going to be determined on primary care. And we in America have it flipped backwards. We have a system where there's one out of every three doctors is a primary care doc, where the other places in the world that have been able to contain costs and yet still deliver high quality care they have two primary care doctors for every three doctors. And one of the things that um, has become abundantly clear, and I'm hopeful that the legislature will reach out and work with higher education, is that we need to try to put in place um, more graduate students in the state of Vermont when it comes to whether it's a, a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant, or even expanding our MD program at UVM because you can get into um, all the scholarships and things like that and yet what becomes clear is that once one state does it, the neighboring states just trump it and then it's up to that state to go back and raise it again. But if they actually attend school here in Vermont and graduate in Vermont, they're more likely to stay here. And so I'm hopeful that um, we can um, look at this through the lens of higher education and try to create more graduates in Vermont so that we can start to increase the availability of primary care and trying to make sure that every Vermonter has um, timely access to primary care. I guess my concern is that access to primary care requires both that there be a primary care doctor that you can access and that you had the financial resources to do that. And I've heard a lot of really good things here today. I don't disagree or question any of what people have talked about here. I think it's great. But I'm really starting to get concerned that we're not paying attention to that other aspect. 
How are we making sure that people can afford to access this care? How can we, uh, even one of the examples, the man with the COPD, most of the problems were behavioral, and you can fix that with the nursing program. <clears throat> but part of what you were saying is that with all the medications he was prescribed, he couldn't take them all. That's the part of access to care that really has me concerned because I don't see the all payer fixing that. I'll, I'll just leave it there. I know you probably. I think that uh, the all payer has more incentive to fix it so that it's less costly care than the catastrophic event that occurs later. So I actually think that there is hope in a population health model that you're keeping somebody healthier so that they never get to the high cost care at the acute setting that Tom will rack up the dollars for, but he doesn't want them in, in his place either. So I, I think it's a step in the right direction. I just add one point on the primary sure. care side. We are, um, and you raise, raise good points, one of the things we're acknowledging is a need for more primary care doctors. With our relationship with Dartmouth that we're trying to finalize, one of the things that we have on the drawing board as an idea, not a plan yet, is creating a primary care teaching program. That, and where I came from before, I was at a place that uh, it was bigger than here, but not that much bigger. We had, we had a residency program. We, we had, on average, 25 residents. And when they graduate every, every year, probably one-third to 40% stay locally. And we got to the point where we had an oversupply <laughs> of primary care doctors. <laughs> and it was a wonderful problem. <laughs> <laughs> the place not Ulster County, New York, not much different than this area here. And I think if we can create that model here, and we can give great experiences for teaching programs, because most teaching programs for primary care is done in the outpatient setting. I think it would be a, a tremendous opportunity, not only for this area, but for the state. And um, so that's uh, something that, um, and by the way, we don't turn away people. Uh, we accept, we accept people, no insurance, we accept Medicaid patients, so that's one of the premises, especially of a teaching program, is that you take all comers. And um, in the same way we're opening the dental program in about two months, that program will take all comers. Just to add that. Other questions or comments? Uh, um, my name is Sadie, and um, I work for the Agency of Human Services in the Secretary's Office. And I work in this community and in Linden County. So my territory covers the, both the region that you're going to see today, today and tomorrow, although I won't be there tomorrow, so I apologize. Um, and I just, and, and as I think about um, kind of what is your role and trying to understand, you know, for all of us where your limitations are and what your latitude is, thinking again as you look at hospital budgets, how are hospitals moving in this sort of a direction versus um, staying in the traditional um, budgeting uh, mechanisms. I mean, you know, how they approach their budget needs to start changing. And I think you guys have, you know, the, the right lens to be looking at that. And you have an example here where they, this is a place where the hospital is putting their money where their mouth is and, um, and doing incredible things. And, um, and really helping, I think one of the key things is they're accountable back to the community because of that. And they've helped stabilize other community partners that contribute and in large part to that 40%. So, you know, helping, um, you know, instead of opening this program themselves, funding it or stabilizing it at a community partner, bringing in somebody who already provides that versus hiring them away from that agency to do it themselves, that kind of philosophical um, approach, you know, will show up in their budgets. And so I just think that that's, um, I can't say enough about the commitment of this region toward that and that that's what I would hope you know, as you apply your general principles to your duties and responsibilities, as you look at the budgets, are hospitals really starting to come from this place 
And then are you seeing it in the, in the dollars, and the allocation of dollars? Um, because I'm sure there are hospitals that are, maybe don't know how to do that. Maybe they really want to, but they're just not sure how. Um, so it, that makes me think of just sort of this aha moment that we hospital-based nurses had when we first went on this journey. And I think that healthcare in this country has been delivered kind of in the medical model. You go to the doctor, he gives you a list, you take the meds, you do what he says, and we live healthily ever after, only that doesn't happen. And I think what, what was really clear, and I remember it was a slide you showed me, that the patient has control, and they're exerting their control. Ultimately, it's their decision what they're gonna do. And I think in this country, we need to meet patients where they are at. We're not gonna get them to do necessarily exactly what the doctor wants them to do, so we have to go to them, because they're not gonna come to the class to us, meet them where they are, and then negotiate with them to hopefully embrace some of it, and that's gonna get them closer than they were previously. And you know, I think that's kind of the crux of what we found. They're not gonna take all the meds, they're not gonna follow that script exactly, and we may be able to get them to set personal goals that will help them. You wanna to go to your granddaughter's wedding, then you might wanna try this, because it might help you to get there, because then it becomes meaningful for them. So it's almost a whole different mindset, mm -hmm. and I think we're all kind of united understanding that now and trying to share it more broadly. And if I just want to jump in here to echo your point and also to address your question, or not to your question, your comment, Sadie. Um, having sat on the board now for three years, I can tell you that we have had, for the three years that I've been on the board, we have had um, a net patient revenue target, and we've had an additional overage, shall we say, of 0.4%, 0.5% for health reform investments. And one of the things I can just say, having sat on the board probably longer than that, well, definitely longer than that, <laughs> um, is that I have seen a major shift in what hospitals are putting forth in terms of the health reform investments that we're seeing. Um, and a true, you know, not every hospital is on, everybody's on a path, and I would say this particular community is well on its way on that path and some of the innovations that we've seen here are really truly inspirational and should be replicated in other parts of the state. But um, there are areas of the state that are really trying, you know, well, this is like every community is a little petri dish of trying to figure out how do we all get together, how do we do this better, how do we think about the population and health of our community. So I can just say from my perspective of having seen this over the years, this last budget cycle, I think I was the most impressed by the types of innovations and where we're going as a state versus three years ago. Some of the health reform investments were, but I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> Air quotes around that. So, anyway, while, while we're talking about um, going to where they're at, like Billy pointed out, and the community working together, Tom, it might be good if you had all your community partners that are in the room stand up and oh, yeah. yes. introduce themselves. Let's see, uh, Dr. Douglas. Can we just say who they're with? Yeah, yeah. is with, introduce yourself. I'm uh, Richard Dundas, and I apologize for offending any of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you You're going to have to try <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have not <laughs> seen <laughs> by now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the founder and medical director of the Bennington Street Clinic, and I was in practice here for 40 odd years before are that. You, are you in any relation to Dr. Dundas from Castleman? No. Okay. <laughs> you're, the, you're the 900th person. <laughs> Mary? Oh, I'm not. Uh, well, I I am on the boards of, of uh, several nonprofits and um, was very active with the Homeless Coalition, but I um, am also with the Vermont Workers Center on Rights and Democracy. Rona? Hi, I'm Rona McCall, and I'm a clinical consultant with One Care Vermont in the Bennington Health Service Area and also the Brattleboro Health Service Area. Great. Are we going to see them yeah. all too? <laughs> I'm going to try to work it out. <laughs> Taking attendance. <laughs> so, I did the case. I'm the medical director at United Counseling Service and representing United Counseling Service, which has early childhood services, as you know, Head Start. 
in both Pownall and North Bennington. And we have a Manchester office as well as a Bennington office. We have substance abuse outpatient in, uh, and community rehabilitation, adults and children services, including emergency services and triage in the community. And we have a lot of blueprint contracts, clinicians working in primary care offices. One of the things we've done through our consultation for psychiatric services at SVMC, because the primary care physicians are affiliated with SVMC, uh, one of my standards has been since I've been there since January 2015, has been any clinician, any prescriber is free to call me if they want a phone consultation, which a number of them do as they see people and write prescriptions. because. We're a very scarce resource. Um, we don't have a lot of psychiatric nurse practitioners or psychiatrists. And so we have a lot of very smart clinicians, and we try to extend those services by providing a resource to them. Um, I'm one of the pharmacists at the hospital, and I've been working with Billy and her team uh, in the transition of care, uh, providing our pharmaceutical Will your, will your pharmacy be hurt by the uh, changes that are made on the three more to be pricing? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Huge. I understand Rollum is a, a party to the lawsuit that it's about to be filed. A, a very significant impact here. Yes. And part of that has allowed us to shift. You know, all of the resources we use were hospital and we're, we're just kind of redeploying them, but they're still in the hospital budget. And that was part of what allowed us to free up some hours to be able to do that other work. And right beside Ms. Michelle Lester. Lester. Also pharmacist in the hospital, um, along with Frank, I've been on home visits with the transitional care nurses um, to help them with their medications to help bridge that gap so that they can take the most important medications, the ones that they can afford. And Sadie, um, I know uh, she's I'm about to leave. She's, about to leave. <laughs> she's really a key collaborator and working with all of the agencies and services that, that there's probably an additional uh, uh, 15 partners at least that we work with <laughs> through Sadie. Yeah. So again, I work for Al Gobe's office and the Agency of Human Services. And, and I do that similar work in both of those, and I'm on the steering committee for their um, community collaborative care. Thank you. I'm sorry. I you have one. Track. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hi, I'm Kathy Gold. I'm the district director at the Vermont Department of Health here in Edmonton. Ken? Uh, my name is Ken Sigsbury. I'm the executive director of the Turning Point Recovery Center. I am a executive community member of the Alliance for Community Transformation here in Bennington. And recently I was appointed to the Governor's Opiate Council. Um, we we uh, recently received, uh, uh, were awarded a grant um, through the state to put uh, peer support people in uh, the emergency rooms at the hospital. And that'll probably start up in January. And Ron? Hi. <clears throat> I'm Ron Chaffee, CEO of the BNA and Hospice of the Southwest Region, which includes Bennington Area BNA and Hospice, Manchester Health Services, Dorset, and Rutland Area BNA and Hospice. And uh, we have been very fortunate to work with Tom and his team, <coughs> Jim yeah. Wald, a few years ago. Yeah, just, just to add to Ron's comment, if you won't say this, but. Um, Ron's an example, his organization, is where hospitals, us included, have to decide you know, what business we can do well and what one we should look to partner with. And this is an example where we had a competing BNA, Ron had one here, they were doing, they had a more comprehensive program than we had, they were more cost effective, and we said, let's merge our program into theirs and let's work together. And since that's happened, the services have been a broader array of services. It's met our needs of our region. They've expanded and become stronger financially. So I think it's an example of, you know, it was a, by our subtraction, we became stronger in terms of that, you know, having that service and having lines firmly involved. So I think we can do more of that in healthcare. And for full disclosure, both uh, Tom and I are recovering the board members. <laughs> <laughs> 
board members we ever fired. <laughs> to create Rise Vermont Bennington, basically, and shift the focus to hospital stays and dollars spent on illness to dollars spent on well-being. So we are having our third meeting of a community group that we put together, and um, she found $25,000 left in a budget that she could shift, and that is going to be our goal next, is to really work on that part. and. You know, we were so impressed with the work done in the original <coughs> Rise Vermont and are really excited to get started with that. We have Jill Barry Bowen come down and mm -hmm. talk. She's yeah, just she's uh, infectious. <laughs> she is. So, is there any uh, other member here that would like to uh, offer anything? If not, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Do I have a motion to adjourn? I move. A second. Good moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you very much, Bennington. Uh, we're very impressed. With, uh, anything that we can do, you know how to get all of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.